Good morning. <laughs> uh, you might be exercising your right to remain silent. I know one person who said they have the right to remain silent, but not the ability. Anybody know somebody like that? Yeah. How many are grateful that, that we have other rights and not just the ones given to us by governing authorities, but the right to freedom given to us by Jesus. Could we just give an applause to God for that right today? So grateful for it. Everyone is tempted by something, but not everyone is tempted by the same things. And what we often don't realize is we think that all temptation is for bad things. Sometimes we're tempted by good things, but to try to get them in inappropriate ways. We're impatient. We think that if we don't take it when it's available, it'll never be available again. And yielding to temptation actually can do everything from reducing our life to ruining our life. And the challenge is, is that you can't tell on the front end how much impact it's going to have. In fact, often we see temptation as adding something to our life, but in reality, we are taking something away from our life. Maybe not in that moment, but eventually it will be true. So I'd like us to think about the topic of temptation today, and we're going to turn to probably the most famous temptation story in all of Scripture. And uh, it's included in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's Gospel. We're going to look at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, and beginning in the first verse, and it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry, and the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world, and he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all of this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and the news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. It takes a deep work of the Spirit to prepare for temptation. It takes a deep work of the Spirit to prepare for temptation. How are we supposed to deal with temptation? Are we supposed to flee it or are we supposed to face it? There's actually biblical stories that show both options. I think the short answer as to what we're supposed to do in that moment is largely determined by who's leading us in that moment. And Jesus is being led by the Spirit in this moment. I heard one person say this, they can resist anything but temptation. There are people like that. C.S. Lewis has an amazing quote. This is what he says. A silly idea is current that good people do not know what temptation means. This is an obvious lie. Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. A man who gives in to temptation after five minutes simply does not know what it would have been like an hour later. That is why bad people, in one sense, know very little about badness. They have lived a sheltered life by always giving in. 
<laughs> that is such a phenomenal quote. It gives us such amazing insight, not just into the temptations we face, but what's going on on the inside of us. I do believe that the deeper we are led into the wilderness, the further we can go in life. I think if we, are, if we try to avoid those wilderness or desert experiences, we'll find ourselves very limited in life. If we don't learn to deal with our temptations, we will find ourselves easily distracted or we'll find ourselves tapping out of difficult and struggling times. Before Jesus could begin his effective ministry, he was actually led by the Spirit. Now, this is important. God did not tempt Jesus. The Holy Spirit did not tempt Jesus. He was led into the wilderness where he would be tempted by the devil. And the thing about temptation is it can come quite suddenly. You're never really sure when it's going to jump up and you're never really sure what it's going to be, but we can prepare even though we can't predict what we're going to be tempted by or when it's going to happen. It takes a deep work of the Holy Spirit to prepare for temptation. Um, this is why it's interesting because you'll be surprised where the Holy Spirit would lead you. We would all prefer mountaintop experiences with beautiful vistas and gentle breezes. The idea that the Holy Spirit would lead us into a desert is something that doesn't appeal to us, but the Holy Spirit does some of his very best work in the wilderness. We should be careful not to avoid the places where God does really good work. Now, wildernesses and deserts don't always look the same. There's lots of different kinds of wildernesses. And the point here is that the Holy Spirit will lead us into them, not just so that we're tempted, but so that we can be shaped, so that we can be grown, so that we can be developed, so that he can prepare us for the things that lie ahead. It's a training ground. We all want a deep encounter with God, but our natural tendency is to avoid some of the environments he does some of his best work in. Now, you don't actually have to travel to a geographic location where there's a desert. We can go through a season that feels like a desert to us, or we can even experience a desert in our own soul. So Jesus faced his temptations. Our temptations might be different, but they will be just as real. And, uh, and we have many, like, if I started a list of temptations, I wouldn't be able to complete it in our gathered time today. Here's what I do want you to know is it's the temptations we ignore that tend to gain more power over us. The temptations we ignore are the ones that seem to come back and control us. So, and I mentioned earlier, we're not always tempted to do something bad. Sometimes we're actually tempted to do something good. You might have a responsibility that's very important. How many have some responsibilities you would prefer not to be responsible for? Yeah, anybody? You know, there's just things that, that are not enjoyable to do, but they have to be done. The interesting thing is, is when you have a really important responsibility like that, we can find good things to do, not bad things, but good things to do instead of doing the best thing. And so temptation can include that kind of experience. And we have different kinds of temptations in different ages and stages of our life. The things that tempt a 20-year-old might not be the same things that tempt a 60-year-old, though they could be. We have to think through how temptation evolves in our life and how the Holy Spirit can do a deep work to help us to prepare for it. The point of this that I want us to really grasp this morning is that who we listen to will determine how we manage our temptations. Who we listen to will determine. There's hundreds of verses in scripture where God keeps calling us to listen to him. Listen to what the Lord is saying. Scripture also calls us to love him. With all of our being, when Jesus was asked the most important commandment, love the Lord your God with all your being and love your neighbor as yourself. Here's the challenge is, you can't really love someone if you never listen to them. You might be impressed by them. You might be infatuated with them. But in order to have a loving relationship, it requires communication. 
And Jesus had listened to his father. Jesus knew the scripture. In fact, in every one of these temptations, he quotes scripture back to the evil one who's trying to tempt him to fail. If you want to start hearing God, I would encourage you to start reading his word. That's the beginning place. He's given us so much valuable information. And let us be careful not to separate the word of God from the spirit of God. And don't assume that he won't say anything to you personally. But the beautiful thing about knowing scripture is that when those personal promptings come, you have a litmus test by which to assess whether it's authentic and genuine or whether it's just a thought of your own or someone else's. We start with the word of God. And the evil one has a goal in all of his tempting, not just to get you to fail, not just to get you to do a bad thing, but to sever, to separate a relationship, to separate your relationship with God and to separate your relationships with others. It's astonishing how frequently yielding to temptation does exactly that. And the Bible is filled with examples of, of people who experience that separation. So this the devil says to Jesus, if you're the son of God, turn this stone to bread. Turn stones to bread. I think this is a, a temptation where we are tempted to think that we are exempt from problems. Let me, that's not obvious, is it? But let me explain. He's not just saying, if you're the son of God, prove it. What he's saying is, if you're the son of God, why would you ever have to be hungry? If you're God's child, why would you not have everything that you need? Why should you ever lack anything? You shouldn't be starving. You shouldn't be hungry. You shouldn't be without. You're a child of God. And this is the temptation to entitlement. That if I'm God's child, I should get whatever I want whenever I want it. Uh, when we're starving for something, when we're hungry for something, we might be tempted to think, I should have that because I'm God's child. And when we're really struggling, sometimes we might be tempted to think, maybe I'm not God's child because I'm going through this. Sometimes we might be tempted to think, maybe God's not real because I'm going through this. But a lot of times we're tempted to think, since I'm God's child, I shouldn't have to go through this. It's a predominant temptation in our culture. And Jesus responds by quoting from Scripture. Man does not live on bread alone. I'm fascinated that he identifies with his own humanity. Man does not live on bread alone. Matthew's gospel includes the words, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The Spirit leads uh, us into the desert, not just so that we would be tempted, but so that we can gain confidence in God's word. There are some ways we will never know how, how incredibly powerful and effective God's word is until we are in certain environments where we discover that by what we're facing. So... I need bread to live, but I also need God's word to live. Then the devil takes him up to a high place. And uh, uh, you can find that beginning in verse 5. And he, he shows them in an instant all the kingdoms of the world and their authority. And he tells them, this is all mine, and I can give it all to you. And all you have to do is just bow down and worship me. One knee, one time. It's all yours. And... Uh, you have to know that Jesus loved the world and he came to redeem and restore it under the authority of his father. That's his goal. That's his mission. That's why he's here. And it would be so easy to, to look at the option present itself as though this could be done in an instant. See, I think this is the temptation where we are tempted to make our work our God. 
I know it's not obvious again, so let me walk you through this. Jesus' mission was to redeem and restore the entire world under God's authority. He's being given the opportunity to take that authority right now. And if he had done so, what he's really saying is, is my mission is more important than my relationship with my Father. This is the way that I can get it. See, God created us to work, and God created us to do meaningful work, but the problem is when our work doesn't just become a good thing to us, it becomes a God thing to us. People think that if, if, they, if, they, if they work because they love something, I mean, isn't all love from God? Some of the greatest sins have been done in the name of love. The headlines of our history have been filled with people who fell from very lofty heights and when asked why, they will say because they loved their country so much. There are people who have engaged in illegal activity in order to bring more money into the household and if you ask them why, they'll say because they love their family so much. If God is not our first love, we will not have an appropriate order for all of our other loves. Whatever you make most important is going to control your life. And Jesus will not say that the mission he's on is more important than his relationship with his Father. One need. One time, it's all yours. Jesus' love for his Father is what keeps all the other loves in perspective. I think there's a lot of wisdom in that for us. And then in verse 9, it says, The devil took him up to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. I said, if you're the Son of God, throw yourself down and angels will catch you. They won't even let you hurt your foot against the ground. They'll lift you up. This is fascinating. The, the devil takes Jesus up to the holy city and puts him on the top of the holy temple. And then he quotes God's holy word, holy, holy, holy. What is happening here? If you think that temptation only occurs in desert wastelands, you would be mistaken. The devil brings temptation into religious settings and spiritual settings as well. Just because you crossed a threshold into a house of worship today doesn't exempt you from being tempted even while you are here. The tempter takes Jesus up. What's the temptation here? The temptation is to misuse Scripture. Scripture says, you can jump. The angels will catch you. Has anybody ever seen bungee jumpers off of bridges over bodies of water? One of you. Thank you. <laughs> For the rest of you, there are people who strap their, their legs to these elastic ropes and they go off the edge of the bridge, and sometimes they've measured it so accurately that you actually fall into the water, and then the rope bounces you back up. Uh, how many would like to try that? <laughs> yeah, that's quite a few of you, actually, and now I'm worried. <laughs> uh, we're not doing that this morning at, at Calvary Assembly. Uh, how many would do everything you could to avoid that kind of situation? I saw a video of the meanest thing I've ever seen where a person, he's, he's uh, on the bridge and he's got a bungee strapped to his feet and he's ready to go and, and the, he starts leaning backwards and just, just as he's leaning backwards, the instructor starts screaming at him like crazy and throws a rope to him which he tries to grasp and doesn't get and he thinks all the way down that he's going to die. And in fact, he's very well secured to the bungee and he bounces back up. I guess the most alive you will ever feel is when you think you are dead. <laughs> I don't know what that adrenaline rush would feel like, but I'm going to try to avoid that one. 
He takes them up, and the, the goal here is to misuse Scripture. God says the angels will catch you. See, temperature doesn't just work in deserts. It works in temples, too. Scripture has been misused to justify attitudes and actions that do not reflect anything of the heart of God. Some of the meanest people I've ever met quoted Scripture while they were demeaning someone else. What they are doing is not holy. That's temple bungee jumping. And they're misusing God's word. And sometimes people try to misuse God's word as a means to control him. Your word has said, therefore, you have to do this for me. As though God has no options once you find the right verse and say it the right way. Jesus insisted on treating God as God. He's the one who's in control. And he actually responds with Scripture because the best way to interpret Scripture is through Scripture. You see, a lot of people, they try to interpret Scripture through whatever the assumptions of our culture or the assumptions of our own heart are. That's an unwise thing to do because our culture and our heart will change radically from season to season, even sometimes from day to day. But Jesus insisted his father should be treated as God no matter what. We should not start with our assumptions and try to interpret God's word that way. So why am I talking about this? And, and uh, I think, first of all, we're all going to face temptation and we should be prepared for it. But I'm also aware that heading in, we're heading into the summer. How many have enjoyed the sunshine and the, the warmer weather that we've had? Isn't this nice? We're, we're looking forward to this. And, and it's, uh, we, we hope we get lots of wonderful days like this one to come. That's good. But in the summertime, sometimes we have a little bit more free time or a little bit less structured time. And so you could take advantage of that. And I'd like you to think about this just a little bit. Now, I know some will not have this option, so I don't want you to feel bad. And I don't want you to think that, that you have to take a full day away in order to incorporate the things that I'm going to talk about. But here's a strategy for spending a day in the desert. Why would you want to? Because God does some of his best work in deserts. So, it is possible when we're weary to find rest, it is possible when we are empty to be refilled. It is possible to recover our identity when we feel like we don't know who we are. And sometimes that happens by these moments with God in a wilderness. So first of all, find a place that is quiet. I know some of you are going, I don't have a quiet place. I've got two kids and a dog and a spouse, and none of them are quiet ever, and I know. But try to find a place that's quiet. And then in that quiet place, focus on a part of God's word that you can immerse yourself in throughout that day. The goal here is not to read as much of God's word as possible, but to find a part of that word that you want to focus on, to move your thoughts around and through. And by the way, when you're doing something like this, it's really helpful just to have a journal with you where you can capture some of your thoughts and your insights. By the way, another thing that will happen is in, in this kind of uh, experience, you might become aware, you'll have insight into how the enemy is tempting you, how the evil one is trying to distract you. That's it's really helpful to jot those things down so that you are aware of his strategies against you. Third thing, be flexible. What do I mean by that? If you go in with a very strict agenda for how this day with God is going to go, what you will discover is, is that you might feel like you've accomplished a task, but you won't feel like you've spent time with him. If you need to spend more time in scripture, do that. If you need to spend more time in prayer, do that. Uh, you could even go for a walk. How many know that you can have spiritual thoughts while you're walking? 
It's true. Like there are lots of things that you could do that would help. Maybe it's some worship music that you want to sing or to listen to. The goal is to be with God, not just do something for God. And so being flexible helps. And then identify the reason that brings you. This is the fourth thing. Identify the reason that brings you to this time. Are you tired and weary and you're trying to find strength? Are you disheartened and discouraged and you need to be lifted up? Are you losing hope because the situation will not change? Are you just hungry to know more of God's love and his presence and his power? Are you trying to find ways to use the gifts that he's invested in you to serve others really well. It's really good to know why God has called you to that moment. What drives you there? Just be aware of that focus. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come up. The last thing is to cultivate a heart of trust and surrender. Cultivate a heart of trust and surrender. In time like this, you may very well get insight into what God wants you to do or maybe even stop doing. There would be a lot of wisdom in approaching that with an idea that you want to yield to God because the truth is we're either going to yield to God or we're going to yield to our temptations. I think the last thing that I would say, when Jesus was tempted to leap from the temple, I mean, that would be spectacular, would it not? That's the kind of thing that would go viral on YouTube. And then Jesus could be the, the man who defies gravity. Jesus could be the man who angels catch. Jesus could be identified as the risk taker instead of as the son who submits to the will of the Father. You would be surprised how often we are tempted to want our, de our identity, our identity, to be connected to some action that we did where God proved himself in our life. Our identity is not that we defy gravity. Our identity is not that angels catch us. If you want to know who you are, look to a cross. You are a child of God that he was willing to give his one and only son for so that your sins could be forgiven and so that your faults and failure could be forever separated from you and so that you could be restored in a right relationship to him. That is who God has called us to be. And anything else will always be less. Let's bow our heads. Father, um, we know we are tempted often, and we know we have a mixed bag in how we respond. Sometimes we get it right and sometimes not. And the purpose of today is to not make us feel bad if we have failed, because you can forgive us. But the purpose of today is to freshly hear your words so that when temptation comes, you have done a deep work in our heart and we will have some way to respond in that moment to continue to be faithful to you. Would you do a deeper work in our heart by your spirit? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand.